Hey guys, this is War Game Chat number 7. Even though this is called War Game Chat number 7, we're going to be talking about role-playing games because most war gamers have played some role-playing games they've liked. Actually, we're going to talk about some of the campaigns we were in. Why don't you talk about the, tell us about the first role-playing game campaign you are in. Okay, I was, uh, this was the spring of 1977. Uh, through my war game club, one of the guys was running a D and D campaign, and he actually finished in the top ten the first uh, origins in the D and D. Nice. And uh, what I didn't realize at this time was that uh, D and D was evolving. I, I was looking forward to a nice dungeon crawl, and we were traveling through the woods and uh, countering monsters and doing all sorts. We get to his town, and my other two guys were having fun robbing people. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I was getting, this is getting creepy. You know, I, I I want to go to a nice dungeon crawl. They want to, you know, it's going to be a. Eventually, the uh, local John Arms are going to catch up with us and hang us. But you know, I want to do something. So I kind of moved out of that campaign. And uh, I remember years later when they had the steam, uh, D&D had the steampunk controversy, I was expecting the uh, dungeon master be pictured and underneath the caption would be evil dungeon master. <laughs> uh. Yeah, my first campaign uh, was this guy, uh, Rob Stone's campaign. Th this was decades ago. He, he just died a few weeks ago, unfortunately. Uh, mm -hmm. um, may he rest in peace. But when it, we started playing this D&D campaign, I had never played D&D before. I, I had heard of it. I, I didn't know what it was. Th this was really long ago. A anyhow, so he had a dungeon with about... I don't know, three or five levels, and basically, like, most dungeon, hack and slash dungeons back then, you're just trying to find the princess who is somewhere in the lower levels, uh, locked up, and you had to, uh, uh, free her. But what was interesting about this campaign is he didn't have a map or anything. A lot of, uh, uh, dungeon masters have a map to show where you are and stuff. He would dictate uh, where you were. He'd be like, you're in a corridor, and the corridor goes left here, or it goes right here. So you'd have, have a piece of paper in front of you, and you were mapping out the dungeon as he was telling you, describing what you saw, and as you moved around and stuff, which, which really got your imagination going. Most dungeon masters don't do that anymore, but it, it was interesting. Another thing I liked is it had all the usual D&D &D monsters, but they all had personalities, I mean, you might walk into a room with an ogre, and the ogre's not necessarily going to attack you. Most of the time, he'd talk to you, ask you, what are you doing there and stuff, and it'd have, like, a distinct personality. Or if you came across a goblin, normally if you come across a goblin in D&D, &D, there's a fight immediately breaks out. Well, well, you might come into a room and see a, a goblin stealing something out of the room, and then he tr tries to escape. So it was an automatic combat, which made it interesting, and the personalities he gave to the uh, monsters... Uh, it definitely made it memorable. We never were able to um, rescue the princess because of the dungeon got more and more difficult as you went along, but we had a lot of fun playing it. Oh, I want to talk about my evil dungeon master. He liked creating his own monsters. W which guy was this? Uh, in the first D&D &D game. Creating his own monsters or creating his own towns. He never liked the supplements. He mm. thought, you know, what's the point if you're going to buy something? Do I know this guy or? No. Uh... I haven't seen them uh, in decades. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah, I forget who. Somebody used to said he uh, moved out of Chicago, so I don't gotcha. know. Gotcha. Uh, after I uh, got out of the D my first D and D campaign, somebody was running a chivalry and sorcery game. Now, a lot of people don't uh, real uh, remember this one. It uh, what I liked about it is that it had more of a back more historical backstory as the dungeon master said that uh, if you want to do token you did D and D but if you want to do a Grail crest chivalry and sorcery was the mm. one and the first uh, thing we did was based on a Harold Lamb short story and um, my uh, character was a man of arms. And he said it was like kind of, you know, I was supposed to patrol, uh, help the pilgrims on pilgrimage to Jerusalem. So I'm telling him, gee, it's like a medieval highway patrol. Mm. Go, yeah, yeah. So my character's name was Broderick of Crawford. Broderick uh, of Crawford? <laughs> yes. And my battle cry was 10 4. Mm. And also, this one was the only place, well, let's put it this way. This is um, the only campaign I've been in where you have to be careful in the magic shop. 
unless you have a magic uh, user with you, you might get ripped off and buy a phony uh, amulet. Every character had a um, personal quest, and I was supposed to look for the uh, relics of a certain saint. And if I did that, I'd become a uh, knight. Mm. It's a erratic. I, I remember this favorably, even though I think we only played six section, se sessions before the dungeon master moved out of town. So, mm. okay. Remember the Seventh Sea campaign we used to have oh, yes, uh, yes, with yes. Uh, Mike Bisberg? Yes. I mean, they're, 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 that game was somewhat interesting. It had exploding dice and stuff. Uh, but the problem was, it, it, at the time, I was a young college student. I would go out drinking on Fridays, and then we would have the game on Saturday, and I'd be falling asleep during the game because I was hung over. Oh, that's right. But uh, I think my character's name was Chico Hernandez. He was essentially a thief. And... Uh, it was kind of a slow-moving campaign. The Dungeon Master is a really nice guy, but his uh, Dungeon Master style is really slow-moving, and he doesn't telescope things very much, uh, meaning move move things along. So, And also you get into situations like where you need like information about something. You go to a town and ask the villagers for information, and not one person in the town would know anything. It's like you just spent the hour and a half uh, talking to everyone in the town, and, and he didn't throw you a single bone, so it was like a frustrating game. Yeah. What'd you think of it? Uh, yeah, that, that was also the problem, is that he's very detailed, or, uh, very stingy with his knowledge. And, of course, I'm working with a couple characters that were kind of, kind of uh, players who are kind of communistic, and I explained to them, don't beat up all the middle class. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, the law enforcement tends to be on their side. Uh, I try to remember, we were reading up, he, they were beating up some landowners, and I was thinking, no, 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 no. Uh, <laughs> and uh, what happened with Mike is that at a certain point he got tired of it and he joined my steampunk campaign. Yep. Why don't you talk about that one now? He's running a steampunk campaign. How long have you been running this? Uh, oh, gee. When Ten years? The, uh, when did Mike uh, uh, stop his campaign? Do you remember? Oh, geez. That's, this has been going on for like close to 20 years then, because that was close to 20 years ago. Okay. I think that was about 20 years ago when he stopped doing the Seventh Sea campaign. So you've been running that uh, your Wilderness Adventure campaign for that long, huh? Tell him about it, because uh, this is a, a role-playing system he made up on his own. You can't buy it or anything. It's yeah. his own creation. Uh, I, one of these days I'll get this published. It's called Out, uh, Wilderness Adventure, and it's basically Avalon Hill's Outdoor Survival Done Right. And uh, people who played it, uh, so they tell me, why don't you make a role-playing game out of it? Well, okay, you know, I, I got the basics for it. Well, Avalon Hill Outdoor Survival role players used to use that map for their role-playing games quite true, often. True. And uh, so I added a uh, start adding things, you know, like you have ability levels. And uh, at the time I started doing this, this is I don't think I. I I'm not even sure if Advanced D&D was out. It was, I, I always referred to this as my un-D&D campaign. So I did things differently. Like, for instance, instead of getting, uh, going to a dungeon crawl and getting 2,000 gold pieces, well, maybe if you get 20 or 30, but, you know, uh, 20 gold pieces got you a lot in this So game. you're doing it in kind of like the 1800s yeah. or something with oh, uh, yeah. uh, steam engines and stuff, right? Yeah. I, I told him my motto for this is... Um, Steamboats, railroads, and airships, and tried to do that all the time. In fact, one of the running, I, I tried at the beginning, the hard part for the characters is uh, this is not D&D, &D, this is not medieval times. So I set up a scenario where oh, they were given a mission to um, they head across 500 miles of desert to get to the destination, and um, they get all the stuff together and they go out and then you know, at some point, I, I, when they're in the middle of the desert, I tell them that you know, if you bother to check the train schedules, you would find out that it only takes you like uh, less than a day to get there by train <laughs> or airship. Or, Speaking you know. of airships and getting there, uh, I think it was Rob who told me you guys took an airship to Mars or something like that in uh, one of the episodes. Well, we went to a portal. Uh, the first adventure I had, uh, they gave them a chance to see how different. It was kind of a uh, mixture of the Searchers and uh, the Magnificent Seven. 
they were supposed to escort a um, Jesuit priest who wanted to do astrological observations mm. in Mexico. <laughs> and um, they had to go through a cave. And then, you know, it took them a while to figure out there were two moons up there. What is it? And of course, it took them a while to understand that uh, when you go to the cave, you go through a portal, you go to Mars. And uh, we were doing stuff like we had to protect the villagers. There was a bandit. There was a, uh, at one point, we had to help Ethan Allen um, become the emperor of Mexico and Mars. This is Ethan Allen was the character in The Searchers. Mm. Yeah. We had a uh, we had one town that was made up of Jimmy Stewart characters, <laughs> including the banker who talks to a rabbit. <laughs> and Liver Duvalis is actually a nice guy. Mm. And um, we also had a John Wayne where everybody was John Wayne character. I, I use either historical people or characters from uh, various westerns. Uh, and one thing also I liked is, uh, um, oh, one thing, the characters work for the Smithsonian Institute. Or think of Wild Wild West, and I decided instead of the Secret Service, he's with, uh, they're with a museum. Because uh, strangely enough, a lot of archae anthropologists and archaeologists uh, doubled as spies in that century. Cool. So, and when we last... Uh, left off. He was working for um, a guy who was building the Trans-Martian Railroad and they were surrounded by all the savage Indians led by the son of Tecumseh, the son of Red Cloud, the son of Sitting Bull. You know, there's a pattern here. Yeah. <laughs> and they, uh, the sheriff was uh, Will, uh, what's his name, the character for Gary Cooper's character in High Noon, the cowardly uh, sheriff. With a psychotic wife, hmm. and um, uh, the guy sent out, uh, you know, the party decided to send out Nellie Olson to negotiate with the uh, Indians, and she did it not Nellie Olson style, which meant that the Indians agreed not to attack, but she gave them a list of people in town she wanted to kill, hmm. and uh, the next scenario where the, the attacks would start. Cool. Yeah. yeah, right now, as you guys know, on my channel, I'm doing the Chronicles of Davis. Story behind that is there's a D&D 5th edition group I've been playing 5th uh, cool. edition with for years. We played 4th edition for a while. 4th edition is awful. I'll never play that, but 5th edition is cool. So anyhow, we used to meet every week and play, but we can't do that due to the pandemic. So we've been... Uh, going on Roll20.net to, to have our sessions there, so I don't get the... I didn't get the use figures in any role-playing games uh, since the pandemic started, so that's why I started the Chronicles of Davis. Uh, where the word Davis comes from is I had another character, it was a fourth edition character called Dave, son of Davis, so uh, th this is his father uh, when he was young. So what, what drives this campaign it is the painting of the figures, because I'll paint a figure and then I'll just add it to the campaign and I'll make a storyline behind it. Like, uh, I just painted a spectator, so the next episode they're going to be dealing with a spectator. And in the future, uh, th there's a wounded, uh, wounded adventurer that I'm painting, and that will add to the storyline, too. There'll be a story behind him when they uh, meet him and so forth. So, And it's caused me to... It's helped me really with my painting because I go through like spurts where I'll paint like a lot for three months and not paint for six months. But with this, I need to uh, at least be painting uh, one figure every two weeks. So it, it, it's keeping my painting going. It's caused me to paint some stuff I normally wouldn't have painted. Like uh, in the last uh, few episodes, I've had an angel. And uh, I had a box of five angels. I didn't know. I thought they were cool. I didn't know what to do with them. So I painted one up and just added it to the storyline and stuff. So it, it, it's like a mi miniature painting driven campaign. I wanted to think uh, with the Wilderness Adventure System, I, I tried. We had a Renaissance era game uh, with, with the same people who did the steampunk game. Uh, one day we uh, did. We did it something different, and they were they were on a quest to meet the uh, Prester John. And at the end of uh, the session, they managed to get to his capital. Mm -hmm. So, and also, uh, uh, we gotta bring up Rob's name. He ha I went with him uh, a couple years ago. He had a D and D campaign 
uh, his original old school edition. First time we did Dungeon Crawl, and now maybe sometime in the future, maybe I'll get a chance to fight a dragon. Mm -hmm. So. Cool. Anyhow, that's all we got for this time. We'll have a new topic for next week. Thanks for watching, and have a good evening. Yeah.